Good morning. Welcome to everybody. Uh, I'm here just to say uh, a few words, introducing Julian Kiverstein, who is the first one who is uh, talking this morning. Uh, he's currently teaching at Amsterdam uh, since 2011, if I'm not wrong. Uh, famous phenomenologist working between phenomenology and neurophenomenology. He gave important contribution uh, to the uh, issue <coughs> Uh, called uh, usually called uh, natural, the question of naturalizing phenomenology. Uh, I give you uh, the word, please. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to be talking to you today about self-learning machines, machines that learn through a kind of statistical learning. They're based on an older generation of research that's been going on since the 1950s using neural networks that are loosely based on the organization of the brain. So they are um, computer generated models that are organized around modeling the behavior of neurons and synapses at uh, multiple levels of organization within the brain. And these kinds of models are uh, extremely influential. They've led to breakthroughs in um, face and speech recognition in language translation in image classification and in gameplay. These are all uh, problems that have been very difficult for classical approaches to artificial intelligence that start from uh, symbolic based representations um, and try to program machines to perform tasks that humans can perform using rule-based symbolic forms of representation. So these uh, statistical learning machines have been able to accomplish all kinds of uh, tasks that were very difficult for classical artificial intelligence. And uh, I want to start with the uh, example of AlphaGo from DeepMind that many of you will be familiar with from the movie AlphaGo, the movie that came out uh, in 2020. It was on Netflix for a while, but you can also find it online. And uh, Go was uh, thought to be a, a huge challenge for artificial intelligence for a long time because of the, first of all, the number of possibilities that players are uh, faced with at any particular move. Whereas in chess, it's, the, it's around 20 possible moves that the, that the players have to select from. With Go, it's more like 200 possible moves. And the possible configurations on the board are just huge. So the computational complexity of this game is just enormous. And uh, yeah, it was thought for a long time that if artificial intelligence could crack this game, then that would be a huge breakthrough. And, and this is what uh, DeepMind was able to achieve with AlphaGo. And the story that I want to start from, which is uh, nicely portrayed in the film, is the, the competition that uh, DeepMind organized with the world champion, Lee Sedol, who had won the, this world title 18 times in a row and went up against AlphaGo. And AlphaGo actually succeeded in beating him four times out of five. Um, now, what's interesting about the game AlphaGo is that it seems to require intuition. So if you ask a, a player, or why did they make a particular move? They, will, they won't be able to tell you what their reasons are. They'll just say, well, it felt right. So if you're to build a computer program that can, uh, that can beat the world champion of Go, then it's gonna have to be a, a program that can model human intuition in some way. Um, and what AlphaGo was able to, to achieve was not just uh, playing at a human level of play, but so not just mimicking human intuition. It was also able to develop unconventional strategies, creative new moves that humans would never have made themselves, that, that even made no sense to humans. Um, and that raises all kinds of interesting philosophical questions, of course. Uh, so here's what Lisa Dole said about um, a move that was made by AlphaGo in the second of the games that they played against each other. He said, I thought AlphaGo was based on probability calculations. It was just a machine. But when I saw this move, I changed my mind. 
surely AlphaGo is creative. This move was really creative and beautiful. This move made me think about Go, the game Go, not the machine, in a new light. It made me think, what does creativity mean? What does it mean in the game Go? This was a really meaningful move. And it's that last point that I want to focus on. Uh, Lisa Doll saying that this move that the machine had made was a really meaningful move. Should we conclude from this that Go has some, that AlphaGo has some kind of understanding of the game Go, a game that's been played for thousands of years continuously. It's one of the most complex games that humans play and have devised. Should we conclude from, uh, from the way that uh, Lisa Doll experienced playing against this machine, that the machine actually has an understanding of the game Go? Um, what I wanna pick out is that the move that, Go, that AlphaGo made was one that had an incredibly low probability of being made by a human. So if AlphaGo does have an understanding of the game Go, then it's an understanding that's very different from any understanding that humans have. That AlphaGo was somehow able to, to find something new in the game, something that, uh, some new possibilities that uh, had not been perceived by humans previously. That's extremely interesting. And it raises the possibility of, uh, of machines that can understand, find their way around in a human practice, in something that we would have thought of previously as distinctively human. So is that the point that we've reached with these deep learning algorithms? And to address this question, I wanna go back to uh, a well-known critique of artificial intelligence that was made by the philosopher Hubert Dreyfus back in the 1970s. And what's interesting about his critique of artificial intelligence was that it was made on the basis of phenomenology, ideas drawn from Martin Heidegger's Being and Time, Division One, and from Maurice Merleau-Ponty's Phenomenology of Perception. Um, based on these texts, but also uh, based on Ludwig Wittgenstein's philosophical investigations, Dreyfus argued that computers that had no body, that didn't develop within a culture, uh, would never acquire intelligence. Um, what he had in mind was not so much the uh, kinds of models that AlphaGo is an example of, where these models are built around the organization of the human brain. He was targeting more first generation classical AI that I mentioned that was built around trying to construct programs using uh, symbolic representations and rules for manipulating those representations. But uh, I think we should still revisit his critique of classical AI today and ask whether deep learning machines maybe have rendered that critique obsolete because they are now able to learn from humans just like AlphaGo did uh, through a kind of imitation. So what AlphaGo does was first of all, copy, mimic uh, human play in the game of Go, and then uh, eventually play against itself so as to outperform what humans can do, finding these new kinds of strategies that I just illustrated with the quotes from Lee Sedol. So should we think of deep learning machines as now able to learn how to find their way around in the, show, the social world? Should we think of them as, as developing um, techniques for engaging with the human social cultural world so as to acquire intelligence, even if they don't have a body in the way that humans do, could they nevertheless, through these very sophisticated statistical learning techniques, find a way of developing the kind of expertise that humans have based on their socialization? And I'm gonna eventually argue that no, they can't. Uh, there's still something that even these deep learning networks don't know about the social world um, that humans do, because in the end, we care about making our actions conform with social practices in a way that we haven't yet been able to program machines to. So that's gonna be what I want to argue. I think my talk will connect with Federica's in a nice way. 
based on uh, Federica's title. So we should be able to have an interesting discussion. Okay, just a quick clarification that what I'm talking about here is probably something that straddles the distinction that's normally made between weak and strong artificial intelligence. So here's how Marvin Minsky defined artificial intelligence. He said, it's the science of making machines do things that would require intelligence if done by humans. And then often a, a distinction is made between weak or narrow artificial intelligence, where you have computer scientists building special purpose machines that perform tasks that would call for intelligence if done by humans. So things like uh, detecting diseases from x-rays, um, speech, uh, face recognition, like, uh, well, think of Siri and Alexa who are able to do speech recognition. These are examples of engineering machines to perform tasks that would normally require human intelligence. And this is distinguished from what John Searle called strong AI, where the idea was that computation as carried out by um, a machine could be the necessary and sufficient conditions for the possession of a mind. So if you program a machine in the right way, then uh, that machine would be able to engage in thinking that's equivalent to the kind of thinking that goes on in humans when they perform intelligent well, tasks that require intelligence. So the aim of strong AI is, is to model human intelligence, to learn uh, what it is to be minded in the way that humans are minded. Okay, and deep learning networks are doing something in between these two kinds of AI in that they are attempting to model the human brain at a certain level of abstraction in order to learn about how humans do tasks like abstracting from data uh, categories that allow them to classify images, for instance, or translate between languages. Um, but in many ways, the, the aim really is to, to build machines that, uh, that can solve problems for us uh, so as to perhaps replace um, humans in the workplace for tasks that would normally um, require humans to perform them. Now we can get machines to perform those tasks. But I wanna start from, or go back to Dreyfus's critique of AI, which was focused on first wave classical AI, what's sometimes called good old fashioned AI. And the idea here was that the essence of human thinking is logical inference. So if you, uh, what computers can do is provide you with a mechanical means of carrying out logical inferences. And so the thought was that computation could thereby give us the ingredients necessary for mechanizing thoughts because computers are just uh, inference machines, they're logical inference machines. So whatever computers are doing, it was thought, while well, they could be programmed to do exactly what humans do when they think. So the idea was that thoughts are composed of primitive elements, symbols that can enter into logical relations with each other. And these logical relations can mirror the kind of structure that we find in the world. So objects would uh, be mapped onto names, for instance, properties and relations would be mapped onto predicates. And so you can have a, a logically structured thought that maps onto the kind of structure that we find in the world, where the world is divided up into discrete objects that have properties and enter into logical relations with each other. And um, so this is an ontology that uh, underlied first wave work in artificial intelligence, where the ontology of the world was thought to be formal in much the same way as Wittgenstein described in the Tractatus or uh, you can find in Frege or Russell. The world was logically structured into these discrete objects that have properties that stand in well-defined relations. And the problem that classical AI ran into, sometimes called the frame problem or the relevance problem, was how to get machines to act in everyday contexts. So if you think of uh, these everyday contexts as being represented in terms of objects and properties, 
then you're going to think you'll be able to build up representations of these everyday contexts of action like restaurants or schools using logically structured representations where each of the symbols that the program is made up, up out of would stand for some determinate feature of a situation. But the problem is that everyday situations are not structured such that we can find these kinds of determinate features. Dreyfus argued following Heidegger that everyday contexts that humans are able to act in form a diffuse web of relevance determining relations that cannot be specified in terms of these kinds of determinate discrete features that you could then map onto symbols and um, program a computer with. So Dreyfus was, was drawing on Heidegger's analysis of the worldhood of the world in division one of being and time, where Heidegger describes how um, the world is made up of ready to hand uh, entities that uh, we perceive in terms of the possibilities for action that they offer to us. And nowadays we would think of this in terms of affordances, drawing on the work of James Gibson in ecological psychology. And these uh, ready to hand entities enter into very complex networks of relations with each other, that humans, because of their socialization, because of the skills that they acquire through socialization, know their way around as experts. But machines, when you attempt to program, prank, program them to deal with these everyday contexts of, uh, of action, uh, run into problems because these everyday contexts are not made up of these discrete determinate features. Uh, instead, they are holistically structured. They form these webs of involvement that necessarily make reference to human concerns and interests and needs. And good old fashioned artificial intelligence tried to abstract away from those human concerns, involvements and needs and reconstruct what humans know when they know how to find their way around the world in terms of these logically structured representations and rules. And the relevance problem is the problem of First of all, finding the right representations to tell you how to deal with, uh, with these everyday contexts, like being in a restaurant, being in a school. Um, and then knowing what to do when something changes in that context, how to update those representations. And Dreyfus argued that these problems wouldn't be solved, couldn't be solved by artificial intelligence. Um, because in the end, they call for skills, skills that we develop through our socialization that embody tacit forms of knowledge, tacit know-how that cannot be translated into logically structured representations of discrete objects, properties, and relations. So that's the, the, um, the critique of artificial intelligence that I touched on from Dreyfus from 1972 that was drawing on ideas from phenomenology. What I wanna do in the rest of my talk is to think about whether that critique still applies to today's machines that learn through these complex uh, techniques of statistical learning that are able to pick up on all kinds of patterns um, that uh, are learned basically from engaging with the human social world through learning from the internet, for example. So um, the question I wanna ask is whether deep learning networks, deep learning models, could acquire what Dreyfus called background understanding. Human agents know their way about uh, the world through um, being immersed in these webs of involvement that form the world, uh, like the equipmental networks that Heidegger described in Division One. Humans know how to find their way about in those networks because they're socialized into them through developing in a culture. And if you have machines that now also develop in a culture, could they acquire this kind of background understanding? So cultural and social practices, Dreyfus described, form the, what he called the background to human action. They form the background in that they withdraw from our attention when we act. But at the same time, they form the context in which our actions take place, providing the, a meaning for uh, 
the kind of entities that we encounter as ready to hand. So background practices, these cultural and social practices that we're socialized into as human beings, make the world intelligible to us. They give us an understanding of objects as objects, persons as persons. And ultimately they give us an understanding of what it is for something to count as real. So if machines could be socialized into cultural and social practices in the same way as humans are, could they also develop this kind of background understanding? Could they develop an understanding of what it is for something to count as real in the way that Heidegger was describing and other phenomenologists who saw Merleau-Ponty too in their analyses of intentionality, for example. So as I said, what second wave artificial intelligence, deep learning models of uh, the mind are able to do is track very complex statistical correlations. And they're able to do that through the multiple layers of uh, nodes, neurons, connections between neurons that the networks are built out of. And it's by having these multiple layers of processing, anything from uh, or anything up to 25 layers of processing and having the data pass through those multiple layers of processing that the networks are able to find patterns um, that are um, that are, are coming before anything like our human classifications where our human concepts uh, allow us to categorize the world into objects and properties. Uh, deep learning networks are able to find uh, patterns, statistical correlations that are some, in some sense prior to the kinds of logical, conceptual ways of structuring the world that we have through natural language. So they're able to find something that we can think of as pre-conceptual structure that's prior to the ab our abstract human classifications. And what I want to ask is, well, could that kind of structure allow deep learning models to uh, uh, develop background understanding as, as Heidegger described it. So deep learning networks are able to learn from humans how to sort data into patterns of human interest. And they're able to do that through drawing data from, uh, from our human social practices, uh, mostly from the internet where there's an incredible body of knowledge uh, of what humans do as they go about uh, their lives and in, in uh, interacting with each other. So could deep learning networks find from this body of knowledge that's, uh, that the internet furnishes patterns that allow them to develop background understanding? Can we think of second wave AI deep learning as having solved the relevance problem? Uh, to address this question, I want to go to a model that uh, received a lot of publicity last year uh, of language production called GPT-3. This is a natural language model that is made up of uh, 175 billion parameters learned from the internet. And what this natural language model does is basically predict the next word that's coming in a sentence. And, and then it, it learns how to do that through being exposed to a huge amount of data that is gathered from, uh, from the internet, from texts that are on the internet. And um, the GPT-3 learns to model those texts so as to predict the you know, what, what word is going to come next in a sentence. And what you can do with GPT-3 then is give it some instructions and, and it will be able to carry out the task that it's been instructed to, uh, even though it's not been trained in that task. And so it's going beyond its training to perform tasks that we would ordinarily think of as requiring some understanding of natural language, tasks like you know, writing stories, essays, uh, writing newspaper articles. It was famously used in a, to write a Guardian editorial about whether artificial intelligence is gonna take over the world. Some of you may have read that. Um, 
So should we think of it as having some kind of understanding of natural language based on the statistical correlations that it's learned from being exposed to all of this data? So here's some examples. GPT-3 was asked to write about the hard problem of consciousness. And you can see here what it came up with. It said, why should a bunch of biomolecules along with all the environmental influences on them give rise to experience? And this is its take on what the hard problem of consciousness was. All it was given was the instruction to uh, write something on the hard problem of consciousness. What you can see in the box is what it came up with here, including uh, a quote from Thomas Nagel that made up. Uh, on the other side, you can see that GPT-3 was given the instruction to write a novel in the style of Jerome K. Jerome. Um, and it wrote uh, a little story here about the importance of being on Twitter. And you can look that up on the internet, it's quite amusing. Um, what it did very well was, uh, was mimic, copy the style of Jerome K. Jerome. Uh, what it does here in the writing about the hard problem of consciousness is mimic, imitate what philosophers was, would have said about the hard problem of consciousness. So I think what we can say is that GPT-3 shows some capacity for socialization. It can produce representations that mean something to us as humans. But in a sense, it's a bit like a student that hasn't done the reading for a class. And this is something that a commentator uh, on GPT-3 said in an article in the MIT Technological Review. Basically, it bullshits. It can string together some well-known truths that it's learned from uh, engaging with the internet, can make up information, it can construct what reads like a coherent story. It's able to do what Heidegger described in terms of idle talk, passing on what it's learned from humans without really understanding the, uh, without really understanding what it's saying or what it's writing. Um, I think John Hoagland, also influenced strongly by existential phenomenology of Heidegger and Merleau-Ponty, really nailed the problem here when he said the trouble with computers, and this includes deep learning networks, is that they don't give a damn. So even though deep learning networks may be able to learn to act in ways that conform with our human background understanding, that doesn't mean that they actually themselves uh, embody this background understanding. It just means they're able to imitate it or copy it. Harry Collins, the sociologist, describes deep learning networks as asymmetrical prostheses. What he means by that is that just like a prosthesis, deep learning networks are able to uh, replicate, stand in for, do something that ordinarily would be done by humans. But it's an asymmetrical kind of prosthesis that they offer us because they're not really able yet to participate in human practices symmetrically. And they're not able to do that because they don't give a damn, nothing matters to them. They don't possess background understanding because when they're making their actions conform with human practices, they're not doing that because, they, because anything matters to them in the way that it matters to humans. They're doing it just by extracting statistics from what humans do and then acting based on, the, on those statistics. So just to remind you what background understanding is again, it's contained in our being able to make sense of, find our way about in the web of involvements that make up the human world, what Federica is gonna call the life world in her talk. Uh, those shared cultural practices into which we're socialized provide us with a background understanding, here's Dreyfus, of what counts as objects, what counts as human beings, and ultimately what counts as real, on the basis of which we can direct our actions towards those particular things or people. So we're able to comport ourselves in ways that make sense given these shared cultural practices, because we embody a background understanding in our skills for engaging with networks and equipment, with forms of social coordination. And that kind of shared background understanding is something that, that humans have, but machines I don't think have yet. Now, could they have it in the future? Possibly, we can talk about that in the discussion. But 
deep learning networks do not currently have this kind of background understanding because they don't give a damn. And so whereas for humans, there are better or worse ways to act in accordance with a practice and humans act in ways that uh, they attempt to make conform with the practice because they, they care about making their actions conform with those norms of practice. They care about acting in ways that are appropriate, that are better rather than worse, that are true rather than false. Whereas machines don't yet have that. And we care about this because if we don't make our actions conform with practices, then we're censored by other members of the practice. And that, that is something that matters to us. Um, whereas any machine that learns to take part in our practices doesn't really care about acting in accordance with those practices. So what I wanna conclude then is that deep learning networks are in many ways a milestone for artificial intelligence because they allow for us to engineer machines that can um, find data in, uh, sorry, that when exposed to massive amount of data can find statistical correlations that allow them to engage in actions that, uh, that match the kinds of actions that we, can, uh, that we engage in when we play games like Go, when we engage in cultural social practices. So there's no doubt that deep learning networks are an important step forward in artificial intelligence. But in the end, just like Dreyfus argued for a good old fashioned AI, machine learning models lack background understanding because they don't in the end care about what matters to humans as participants in social practices. So this lack of background understanding means that while machines can learn from us, they will only ever be for us asymmetric prostheses. Prostheses in the sense that they can do some of the things that humans can do that require intelligence, but asymmetric in the sense that they don't themselves uh, participate in the right kinds of ways in our social practices. So what we could talk about in discussion, if it's interesting to you, is well, what would it take to build a machine that, that can symmetrically participate in our social practices? What kind of judgment sensitivity would it require for a machine to be uh, a full member of human cult cultural social practices, or perhaps even to develop its own cultural and social practices, as uh, Lee Sedol described AlphaGo as doing when he suggested that it fa has found its way to these uh, insights into the game of Go that humans have not yet themselves comprehended. Okay, thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Julian. And uh, uh, we decided to let the second lecture follow immediately the first one. After the both, uh, we can begin with the discussion uh, concerning both lectures. Please, Federica, if you want to come here. No, no, that's prima. Oh, no, uh, no I forgot uh, <laughs> to uh, introduce Federica. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Federica Bongiorno is currently, uh, currently means uh, since now, since, mm -hmm. couple of, uh, since the beginning of, of September. Uh, in fact, uh, she's uh, working at the University of Florence. Previously, uh, she was working in Germany, namely in Berlin and Dresden. So please, Federica. Yes, so first of all, I want to thank the organizers, so Floriana and Luca, for organizing this very interesting conference and also for inviting me to join. I am actually very happy to talk after Julian because I do really think that our talks have um, a lot of points of contact. And I have prepared some slides, but just only with, the, with some quotes that I'm going to read in, in my talk just for um, you to follow better what I I am going to say. So the title of my talk, as you can see, is Can Algorithms Be Embodied? A phenomenological Perspective on the Relationship Between, between Algorithmic Thinking and the Life World. And I am going to start precisely with a quote from uh, yeah, um, Catherine Hales seminal book published in 1999, How We Became Posthuman. And 
I am just going to read the entire quote to start with. So you are alone in the room except for two computer terminals flickering in the dim light. You use the terminals to communicate with two entities in another room whom you cannot see. Relying solely on their responses to your questions, you must decide which is the human, which the machine. Your job is to pose questions that can distinguish verbal performance from embodied reality. If you cannot tell the intelligent machine from the intelligent human, your failure proves, Turing argued, that machines can think. So um, what does this mental experiment tell us? And, and I'm going to read again from Hales. Here at the inaugural moment of the computer age, the erasure of embodiment is performed so that intelligence becomes a property of the formal manipulation of symbols rather than in action in the human life world. So at the heart of the Turing test, there lies the erasure of embodiment. Such an erasure has been reinforced by the definition of information provided by Claude Shannon and Norbert Wiener, who have conceptualized uh, information as an entity distinct from the substrates carrying it. And from this formulation, it was a small step to think of information as a kind of bodiless fluid that could flow between different substrates without loss of meaning uh, or form. So the question I pose here is rather um, simple. Uh, what if at the heart of the Turing test there lay not the erasure of embodiment, but it's transformation through processes of digital incorporation. So what if we try to overcome the notion of artificial versus human intelligence by assuming that human intelligence can incorporate artificial external components just as artificial intelligence can simulate human responses. Uh, so what if human embodiment can be augmented technically and digitally? Uh, this is uh, um, not a new proposal, of course. The idea that digital processes do not merely imply a detachment from the body, a dematerialization or disembodiment is supported by many researchers starting already from those who reacted, for instance, to cyberpunk narratives and their tendency to posit a new mind-body dualism. Yet the, here I would like to frame this thesis not within the post-human context, as in Hale's case, but in a phenomenological perspective. And in doing so, I will analyze specifically algorithmic thinking and its um, temporal structure. So let's go back to uh, the Turing test. Um, someone, uh, a human, is observing the responses by someone, something else another human, a machine. So there is an observer and someone or something that is observed. And this poses the problem of re reflexivity uh, already addressed by researchers during the first wave of, of cybernetics and in the well-known Macy conferences. It is interesting that one of the first attempts to develop uh, the epistemological implications of this problem was made by Heinz von Forster in a way that is, I would say, reminiscent of the phenomenological theory of empathy, uh, that is to say by resorting to analogy and the imagination. I'm gonna show you some quotes from, uh, from Forster first. If I assume that I am the sole reality, it turns out that I am the imagination of somebody else who in turn assumes that he is the sole reality. And this means that as Hales observes, I use my imagination to conceive of someone else and then of the imagination of the person in which I find myself reflected. Um, although von Forster himself deemed this argument insufficient to found the reflexivity in a rigorous epistemological way, it remains interesting from a phenomenological perspective because it shifts the problem of reflexivity from observation, from the objectivist point of view, to the observer. Um, Humberto Maturana, whose work influenced for Forster's views after 1969, expressed this point in his uh, 1972 book co-authored with Francisco Varela, Autopoiesis and Cognition, through his well-known maxim, everything said is said by an observer. The relevant point here is that shifting the attention to the observer 
also means giving relevance to a body, the observer's body, with its own context and positioning, to a primal and original experience that is embodied. This is the phenomenological move I am interested in. So the relocation of intelligence, even when artificially augmented within lived experience, what Husserl would call the Lebensfeld. Even though uh, Maturana uh, himself retrospectively acknowledged that his, and at the very beginning, Jerry Letbin's initial attempts to reformulate the objectivist epistemology of early cybernetics ambiguously assumed an objectivist framework, the emphasis on the observer's role is important for it allows us to connect symbolic operations to their foundations in experience. Among the many features of the observer as conceived by Maturana and Barella in Autobiasis and Cognition, I will focus on just one, which holds um, special phenomenological relevance, the structure of coupling. Uh, in order to continue living, organisms must be structurally coupled to some elements of their environments. Humans, for example, have to breathe air, drink water, eat food, and so on. So living systems engage in a two-way mutually triggering interaction with their environment. A change in the environment can trigger effects for the living organism in a way that must be differentiated from causal relationship. Causality is not part of the autoboyetic process itself, but rather of the descriptive domain of a human observer who draws inferences from her descriptive position. Information coding, um, I am quoting uh, uh, from Hales again, information coding and teleology are likewise inferences drawn by an observer. In the autoboyetic account, there are no messages circulating in feedback loops, nor are there even any genetic codes. These are abstractions invented by the observer to explain what is seen. From a phenomenological standpoint, we could say the living system's relationship with their umwelt is essential for them. Cognition, as long as it is understood as an autopoietic process, involves structural couplings between the living system and the environment. When we describe these couplings scientifically, we must pay attention, as the Husserl of the crisis would say, not to confuse the idealized concepts we construct to describe phenomena with the phenomena as such. This is why it is important to return on, on, on one hand to the things themselves, the phenomena under observation, so as to escape the risk of a mere operational discourse, and on the other hand to the observer's position. It is important not to forget that her recognition, her cognition is embodied, that is to say mediated by the sensory and cognitive interfaces of embodied researchers. Clearly, Maturana and Varela's theory is based on the principle of treating cognition as a biological phenomenon. However, they were fully aware of the fact that even artificial systems can become autobiotic unities. Um, if living systems were machine, they write, they could be made by man. Um, but we could then ask, uh, what if we expand the notion of structural couplings in the current digital era in order to include those interactions necessary to the everyday life that involve algorithms. Um, this is where the notion of incorporation becomes uh, useful. Following Hales, who builds on uh, Paul Cornerton's theory, we can understand by the expression incorporating practice, an action that is encoded in bodily memory by repeated performances until it becomes habitual. Such practices always rely on some kind of medium. Uh, so for instance, learning to type is an incorporating practice by means of which we extend our cogn cognitive skills so as to integrate in the extend extended cognitive system th that part of the environment required to perform the action. Well, on these gr grounds, um, I, believe that, I believe that phenomenology can be complemented to a certain extent with externalist theories. Um, we all know that by the term externalism, we refer to a series of theories and positions within the philosophy of mind, sharing the idea that the mind depends in its cognitive functions, not merely on internal bodily conditions, but also at various levels and to varying degrees on conditions external to the body. 
in their landmark 1998 article, The Extended Mind, Andy Clark and David Chalmers propose an active externalism which consists in emphasizing the active role played by the environment in the definition of cognitive processes. And so they write that the external features here are just as causally relevant as typical internal features of the brain. In other words, there is nothing sacred about skull and skin. This is how they express this concept. So if external conditions play a role in guiding cognitive processes, then the mind must be seen to extend outside the body by integrating those environmental components that prove, that prove functional to cognition into the extended cognitive system. Incorporating practices, therefore, involve bodily extension through some type of medium. As such, they must be distinguished from inscribing practices, which instead involve inscription that abstract the practices into science. There is, of course, a relation between the two forms of practice, which is described again by Hales, um, meaning that incorporating practices perform the bodily content, inscribing practices correct and modulate the performance. Thus, incorporating, uh, incorporating and inscribing practices work together to create cultural constructs. Yet, in contrast to inscription, which can be transported from context to context once it has been performed, incorporation can never be cut entirely from its context. The important aspect to be discussed here is stressed by Hales with reference to um, Dreyfus' 1972 seminar work, What Computers Can Do, that also Julian quoted and already mentioned. Um, so embodiment cannot be characterized as algorithmic. In his book, Dreyfus relies on Merleau-Ponty's theory of perceptions as habit in order to argue that human cognition is primarily based on unconscious processes rather than on conscious symbolic processes that can be formalized in heuristic programs for digital computers. This happens precisely because most human behaviors are embodied. This means we don't need uh, all the rules to be specified in advance, um, that is to say, encoded in the algorithmic formalized sense. And Rafius introduces three conditions of embodied learning that are not present in computer programs. First, an inner horizon that consists of a partly determined, partly open context of anticipation. Second, the global character of the anticipation, which relates it to other pertinent contexts in fluid shifting patterns of connection. And finally, the transferability of such anticipation from one sense modality to another. We will see that these conditions can be interpreted phenomenologically. However, I will suggest that this interpretation does not rule out the possibility of digital incorporation. In other words, a phenomenological understanding of algorithmic thinking can help us avoid the opposition between embodied learning and digital coding in Dreyfus' sense by emphasizing the notion of incorporation, precisely in its temporal structure. So we now need to delve into, into um, the phenomenological theory of temporality with regard to embodied and, uh, and algorithmic thinking. And my starting point in this will be the notion of uh, uh, life world. Um, so by the term life world, Husserl describes the everyday non-scientific perspective on, on our environment and surroundings. And the concept refers to the web of intersubjective background understandings that first makes scientific objectifying knowledge meaningful. The life world, therefore, has priority over the scientific interpretation of the world. At the same time, the pre-scientific view and the scientific are connected a priori, which is to say there is a possible correspondence between the practices of constitution of meaning in everyday life and in scientific knowledge between the way things appear subjectively in perception processes and the way they are non-scientifically objectively. This becomes especially clear if we consider the problem of time constitution. As already shown by Henry Bergson, subjective time consciousness radically differs from objective time consciousness since the former is a qualitative and continuous mode of perception, whereas the latter is a quantitative discrete 
mode of representation. What we actually perceive is the subjective duration, which we can represent much means of instruments such as, of course, clocks and watches and so on, that translate subjective time into space and are therefore capable of measuring it. So that is to say that a clock measures the distances or portions of space marked by the hands. What can be measured is, according to Bergson, space and movement, whereas time as such is a continuous flow subjectively experienced by individuals. Objective special, specialized time is therefore common to a certain culture and equally experienced by many people while pure duration is subjectively perceived and differs in this very perception from subject to subject. Even if it, is, it does not directly refer to Bergson's theory, Husserl shares this view of an essential difference, of course, between subjective and objective time. By objective time, Husserl means a pure sequence of now points, which are per se incapable of explaining the connection between the points. When we listen to a melody, what is it that makes us say that we are hearing a melody and not a mere sequence of instant sounds? To interpret the melody as a unity of meaning, we need something more than the simple objective reference to a mere sequence of disjointed sounds as now points. Indeed, the time we experience in our everyday life, in the life world before any scientific representation of time is a subjective and continuous one. It is not divided into fractions. It is a consciousness flow irreducible to objective measurement. And the subjective experience of time is, of course, a structure, so the retention, impression, protection structure that holds for all kinds of perception of objects. However, Husserl is much more interested than Bergson in explaining the correspondence between subjective and objective time. Um, his whole lecture series on the constitution of inner time consciousness is devoted to, to this topic. So through reflection, which is to say representation, we build a correspondence between the subjective experience of a certain content and its placement within an objective time frame that we can repeat independently of the original experience. For instance, through recollection, which is a form of reflective representation, we can reproduce the melody we heard yesterday because we can build an analogy between the moments of the original perception and the moments of its reproduction in the present. This is possible because thanks to repetition mechanisms based on reflection and secondary non-retentional memory, we have progressively objectified subjective time perception into an objective time frame. And we can therefore place if subjective, uh, each subjective time perception within this objective frame. As pointed out by Schneider, time consciousness is always extended and is given by the potential and retentional structure of consciousness, Husserl, meaning that the biolog biological time of life in the form of duration of durée Bergson is partic a particular mode of temporalizing. We have to separate this way of temporal structuring from technical time structuring. So to sum up, subjective experience in the life world and this objective representation in scientific accounts are two different yet at the same time related things. According to Husserl, the life world had become occluded under the impact of the norms of naturalistic positive science set down by Galileo and Descartes in the 17th century. And this threatened to fuel the general disaffection from all rational critical inquiry unleashed by fascism in Europe in the 1930s. This means the priority of life world over scientific interpretation turned into its reverse. The completion of the positivistic view of the world in modernity produced an absolutization of scientific attitude, meaning a progressive oblivion of the sources of um, experience in the life world. And we can see this very clearly in the course of industrialization, which starts, I am quoting, with machines and the steam engine and ends with the development of the assembly line. Certainly, these are the main events which are additionally accompanied by urbanization, electrification, and an increased mobilization of our society. These events would have been inconceivable without the fragmentation of subjective time and experience into objective units measurable in terms of work time and time wage. Computer technology and the internet have recently, from the early 1990s, sped up this process. 
the logic of algorithms is based on the discrete digital objective representation of time processing. Uh, this does, does not mean that it is completely detached from the subjective experience of time contents, but that the very connection between algorithmic knowledge and life world experience has been increasingly lost in the course of IT development. Stated by Schneider, um, who I am now quoting, in introduction books, uh, I am going to show you the slides with the quote. In introduction books for computer science and algorithm, we find an algorithm is a self-contained step-by-step set of operations to be performed. This step-by-step -step definition is only related to an objective time flow and in general is determined by monocausality, if that, then do that, and all steps are isolated from each other. So the very nature of digital processing implies that all steps are distinct and that in the flow of execution, there is no creative continuous influence of the individual steps on one another. Let's consider a standard definition of what an algorithm is. Um, today, an algorithm is defined as a finite and organized set of instructions intended to provide the solution to a problem and which must satisfy certain conditions. These include the following conditions. So first, the algorithm must be capable of being written in a certain language. A language is a set of words written using a defined alphabet. The question that is posed is determined by some given data called the enter for which the algorithm will be executed. The algorithm is a procedure which is carried out step by step the action at each step is strictly determined by the algorithm, the entry data and the results obtained at previous steps. The answer called exit is clearly specified. And finally, whatever the entry that data, the execution of the algorithm will terminate after a finite number of steps. So given this definition, we could schematize um, following again Schneider, the um, different modes of cognition within the life world and the digitized world as um, follow. In the case of life world, communication is enriched with affects, emotion, and non-designative elements such as intonation, micro gestures, and so on. Human environment interaction is always flexible within the flow of interaction, um, which refers to an action embodied engagement in the umwelt. Humans have consciousness, awareness of gestalt in the flow of experience, meaning the anticipatory ability for the whole scene. Um, so as I was trying to show by referring to Husserl's theory of time consciousness, temporal structure is intended as a flow from a subjective point of view. While um, in the case of the digitized world algorithmic knowledge, all levels, the electrical layer, uh, hardware, the host layer and the media layer only have a clear designation and a clear semantic. Computer environment interaction strongly depends on algorithms, which is to say on the databases. And this implies that a representation is needed, which is less flexible because data and relations are given. And in this sense, the interaction with the environment is not embodied, but coded. And this is why computers are generally faster in processing than humans. Finally, algorithms basically proceed as we, as we have seen, step by step, and this even applies to neuronal networks. So they are able to find basic patterns and have no, let's say, ability for the whole scene, even though this is changing with deep learning as Julian was um, explaining. Um, Anyway, this should explain in what sense embodiment cannot be understood in algorithmic terms. Yet, as I have anticipated, um, such a phenomenological interpretation does not rule out the possibility of a certain incorporation of algorithmic digital processes. And again, it is important to distinguish here between incorporation and inscription. While we can incorporate via embodiment, um, which means through bodily extension that expand the cognitive system so as to integrate digital devices into the extended cognitive system, we do not inscribe the algorithmic logic since the code, which means the program, the algorithmic sequence remains basically unknown to most users and does not need to be known in itself in order to use digital devices. 
So embodiment is for sure always bidirectional for it refers not only to the fact that our exchange with the environment is always contextualized and mediated by our body and its sensory motor activities, but also to the fact that the tools and devices that facilitate our experience of the world are increasingly becoming embodied, embedded in our bodily and cognitive capacity. So we are increasingly, in a way, technologizing ourselves, and this technologization implies a double embodiment process. So on one hand, we extend ourselves into reality by means of digital devices, and on the other, these also become embedded into our bodies, increasingly blurring, to a certain extent, lines between the biological dimen dimension and the artificial. So this process of embodiment involves the subjective side of the embodied experience as well as the objective side of the embodied technologies. And this means that, just as in Husserl's account, while well, there is a difference between the logic and temporality of subjective experience, uh, re referring to embodiment and inaction, and the logic of the objective representation, the level of algorithms and codes, there is also a connection between the two grounded in the Lebensfeld. Through incorporation, we indirectly integrate within us, within us something of the algorithmic processes inscribed in the devices we use, but we do not inscribe their logic within our process of thinking properly since this falls outside our embodied and even extended cognition. So can algorithms be embodied? Um, I will suggest uh, the following answer, which is, of course, totally provisional and to be discussed further. They can be indirectly incorporated, but they cannot be directly inscribed into our cognitive, bodily, and intellectual human system. Of course, such a conclusion would be far from neutral. Uh, it would imply that as long as they are incorporated, algorithmic processes can have and do have an impact on our own cognition, if only indirectly. The assumption that at least to this extent, algorithms can be embodied is precisely the reverse of the idea supported, for instance, by uh, Yuk Hui, that knowledge and reason can be exteriorized and automatized in what we call algorithms. I'm going to quote you, Hui, uh, here, because he interprets algorithms as the latest development of reason, totally detached from the thinking brain and becoming more and more significant in our everyday life due to recent rapid developments in artificial intelligence, AI. So, although I I share the idea that cognition can be externalized. I am, I, I am not convinced as Hui that the final stage of human reason coincides with algorithms for two reasons. First, as I have tried to show, algorithms can be incorporated in, in, indirectly, but not inscribed into our cognition. And second, the very fact of incorporation speaks against a total detachment from the thinking brain. However, it is true that the latest developments in AI are leading to a notion of algorithms that complicates the idea of a purely linear, discrete, and operational structure. And I am quoting again from Hui. If we define instructions as sequential step-by-step -step schematizations and understand them as one pole of the algorithm, then the other pole of the algorithmic spectrum will be recursive and nonlinear operations. The spectrum contains different notions of algorithm according to different specific functionalities. And this brings us back to the issue of temporality and discloses the potential risks in embodied algorithms. Norbert Wiener already, he already noted this risk in his 1960 article, Some Moral and Technical Consequences of Automation. And I am concluding by quoting him. Um, there he criticized the assumption that machines cannot possess any degree of originality and that its operation is at any time open to human interference and to a change in policy. I have already mentioned that the objective temporality of algorithms is usually faster than that of human agents. As Hui has observed, the, automati the automation of machines will be much faster than human intelligence and hence will lead to a temporal gap in terms of operation. The gap can produce disastrous effects 
since the human is always too late and machines won't stop on their own. This can lead to what Hui calls algorithmic catastrophes and what I would rather call the algorithmic paradox. If to a certain extent we can incorporate algorithmic processes, this also means entering into a di dialectic relationship between our own subjective fluid temporality and algorithmic automatized temporality. And it is precisely this dialectic that is leading researchers to question and rethink ancient metaphysical problem or problems of contingency and autonomy in the digital era, but I will just leave that to further discussion and I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Federica, for your lecture. Now I propose to, to give uh, to you both the word. Uh, so I ask Julian if you have questions to uh, Federica, and I ask you, Federica, if you have questions to Julian, then we can open the discussion to everybody. Yeah, do, I do have like some. So please. Yeah, I will mm -hmm. come back. See. Um, like, uh, I, I'm just curious to um, know from Julian what he thinks about this, um, yeah, um, about uh, the problem of like the, the current state of, uh, uh, let's say, um, algorithmic uh, thinking and process. Because uh, you started by mentioning the uh, AlphaGo Zero algorithm or program uh, which uh, does uh, not learn uh, if I uh, understand correct correctly from external inputs but like creates in a way its own uh, knowledge and so it is based on a kind of reinforcing learning in a way you know similar to that of, 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 of animals that learn through experiments and reactions and yet the very basic uh, rules of the game must be given to, to it. So in terms uh, of computation, we are kind of reaching a limit now. So either we find a way to um, increase um, performance without increasing computing uh, power, or let's say we have uh, the performance like, like be stagnating as computer, computational requirements becomes uh, a constraint. And so one way could be like in, in AlphaGo zero case um, to use optimization to build network architectures that are um, computational efficient um, to train and at the same time uh, uh, having or retaining good performance um, on some types of learning uh, problems. Mm, using the fact that many that data sets are similar and therefore, yes, they, uh, so machines or algorithms can improve themselves without external um, inputs. Um, but like this is maybe, um, so what do you think about this uh, situation? Uh, but also um, I would like to know your opinion or ideas about another aspect of the problem, which is maybe related to this which is the problem uh, like the, the fact that um, with algorithms now the very, um, at least for me, it seems to me that the, pro the problem is not to like improve their operation of power and capacity to process a lot of data, but quite the opposite. So th the fact that they basically lack what we could call the common, common sense. So the, the capacity of acting intelligently in everyday situation. So being able to draw conclusions with limited experience, with limited, a limited amount of data. Um, so I, I would, these are just like ideas or thoughts that I wanted to share with Julian in order to know how he sees like this current state or these issues or these problems. Yeah, great. Thanks Federico, there's a lot there. Um, so, I think what's interesting about machine learning is that we have a kind of computing device now that can go beyond what the what would previously have been 
programmed. So the way that you were describing algorithms was very much in terms of uh, a set of instructions that's given to the computer by a human programmer. Whereas the, the deep learning networks that, that I was concerned with in my talk are, are able to, by being exposed to huge amounts of data, find their, their own, or learn their own programs, as it were, and learn their own algorithms, uh, kind of program themselves. Um, and that's a interesting technological development in many ways. Uh, it's one that's powering our mobile phones and the internet today. And um, so it's one that's central to, to how we're living in our kind of socio-technological environment today, uh, which I, I heard you describing as well. But is it is it that the kind of structuring of our uh, life world by these technologies is bringing with it the uh, temporality that you were describing that's characterized by you know, the, the old fashioned programs that work step by step. I think you, you were getting a different kind of temporality actually. So Kathleen Hales in her more recent book talks about uh, algorithms that are powering the stock exchange these days and uh, how decisions about whether to buy or sell a stock are being made on microseconds timescales much faster than you know, humans are able to operate. Um, and you know, those kinds of, you know, that, that's really now a part of how the, the stock exchange works. It's part of, uh, of how trading operates that decisions can be made on these fragments of seconds. Uh, so there is a kind of interesting temporality there that's 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 very different from from how humans think, because it's happening at a, a much faster time scale, um, and it's changing the practice. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's also an illustration of what you were exploring in your talk of how the temporality that comes from the digital world is kind of intertwined with the the temporality of uh, the human life world. Uh, so we're, what we're living in now is a kind of mix of these two, a hybrid, as Vittorio Galese was describing it yesterday. Um, yeah, I, I think there are many things to say about how machine learning algorithms maybe um, lead us to think differently about incorporation, as you were describing it in that now we have algorithms that can predict us and our behaviors and actually um, are able to, in some ways, um, hijack human behavior by being able to predict patterns in it and manipulate us. An example will be like the, the kinds of search algorithms that YouTube runs where, um, by predicting the user of, uh, of YouTube, they're able to, to suck people into these um, into these kind of rabbit holes that are very difficult to escape from. Uh, this was explored in the film Social Dilemma, if you've seen that. And so incorporation of algorithms, I think, has, the, has some in interesting ethical consequences in terms of how it allows for human behavior to be manipulated in some ways by, um, by algorithms that can learn from us and, and then learn how to control our behavior, learn how to direct and manipulate our behavior. So those were a few observations I had on your talk, but I think, you know, give a different spin on it if we think about, well, how, how, how does machine learning impact on temporality on the one hand and incorporation on the other? Uh, I think it has some different consequences from the, the kind of step-by-step -step digital uh, computer programs that you were reflecting on in your talk. Um, do I, did I answer any of your questions indirectly there or uh, was it more of a kind of synthesis of our two talks? I think we can... Unless... Uh... Julian has questions. 
to Federica. We can open the discussion. Yeah. Those were my kind of questions. I don't know if you captured what I was saying, but I, I was reflecting on the two uh, topics that you discussed of embodiment of digital technologies and uh, incorporation of those technologies and, and, uh, and temporality. So I was just suggesting that, that maybe the, those two dimensions of your talk kind of look a bit different if we have the the algorithms being these machine learning algorithms rather than the, the more old fashioned computer programs that I think you were basing your description of algorithms on. Uh, but I think you know the, the same issues kind of arise, but they have a different shape to them. That, that was my observation I wanted to share. Um, Do you follow Federica or did yeah, I? Yeah, no, I just wanted to like, mention the fact that um, like for instance the project that I was developing in in the last um, affili affiliation that I had in, 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 in Germany like in Berlin at the ICI was about um, the problem of digital pr practices in contemporary electronic music and I do think that for instance um, artistic practices are a nice example of this interconnection because uh, in that field like um, what you will see is a kind of um, integration, actually, of um, digital and analog production in, uh, uh, in terms of music production and the theory of music, uh, which is very, very interesting because a lot of artists are uh, actually, at the moment, using um, generative, generative algorithms in order to produce like complex musical patterns starting from a, a very limited set of algorithms integrating like feedback loops and a lot of digital actually um, techniques to produce music. And this is really interesting because they are then performing live uh, by combining um, analog, uh, like analog instruments and settings and the digitals. Um, and in terms like of temporal structuring of the composition of the art artistic practice, this is um, very interesting because it, in, it means to a lot of artists in the field like are coming back uh, due to this combination of analog and digital to, for instance, uh, temporalities that are not typically the, the ones that we use, for instance, in the Western classical music. So they are relying to, uh, for instance, Hindustani music, so the, the totally different ways of temporalizing or, or, um, or musical languages. And this is a nice example in my, um, like in my recent research experience of a practical like combination of the two in an artistic way of the two different codes and the different, different uh, language actually in, 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 in cooperation. And I just wanted to mention it because it is the latest example I was working on. Very interesting, yeah. So I, I think there's a difference in what I was concerned with in my talk, which is that you know, you're really thinking about these digital technologies in relation to humans and how humans use them. So for instance, how musicians use them to create music. Mm -hmm. Whereas I was concerned with the, the possibility that we have technologies that can, can kind of think for themselves in, in the way that humans think. So could you have a, a machine learning algorithm, for instance, that uh, takes as its data uh, human musical compositions and then learns from those compositions how to, uh, to construct a piece of digital music itself? And mm -hmm. uh, so that would be the analog of what AlphaGo was doing, where it's exposed to thousands of games played by humans of Go that are available on the internet. And then it, it learns from those games how to play the game itself. So uh, mm -hmm. it's not only learning the rules of Go from, from playing the game, but also learning how to compete at a very high level such that it can then eventually you know, beat the world champion in Go. And so that's, uh, that's an example of how you might have a machine that can, can do what humans can do, can maybe even outperform what humans can do. So uh, if you're a, a cognitive scientist, then you might think from that that we have uh, a model of human thinking and that 
humans think in the same way as machines do, where what they do is find statistical correlations and then use those uh, patterns to make decisions, to, to think, to reason. Uh, so what we have is not just a model of human thinking, but uh, we're actually able to build uh, machines now that think. And that's, mm -hmm. the, that's the possibility that was kind of the starting point for my talk. Which I think is a little bit different from what you were exploring in that you were more thinking about, well, we've got these technologies and how do they, how do humans couple with them? How should we think about this structural coupling of, uh, of humans as living agents with these technologies, such that the technologies could be incorporated into uh, human activities like making music? Mm -hmm. I can take advantage, advantage from the fact that I'm sitting here to put not properly a question to Federica, but I would like to share with you um, an idea, a sort of possible strain uh, starting from your lecture toward a different direction. I'd like to know what uh, do you think about it. Uh, you mentioned the, the notion of life world and everybody who deals or is dealing or has dealt with that notion knows that uh, it is not so easy to grasp, uh, to, to capture the real meaning of it. Uh, mm -hmm. It is a rather polysemic notion. But anyway, uh, if it is uh, correct to say that life world means our common world, the world we share as human beings belonging to a, a very peculiar animal species and so on, uh, so the world, everyday life, uh, this is uh, the first meaning, the most uh, uh, evident meaning both in the crisis and in other uh, related texts uh, of the same period. There is anyway uh, another meaning of it, uh, not so hidden, I would say, uh, whereas uh, um, Husser means uh, um, tries to define um, a mathematical notion uh, concerning the uh, totality, gesamtheit of all possible forms of givenness. Mm -hmm. In that sense, the life world is very strictly related to the notion of Manigfaltigkeit uh, he, that he took from his um, doctor father no? as, as a mathematician, as, as, as he studied mathematics. And so in that case, uh, perhaps this is the question, we could find uh, a broader uh, mathematical frame which allows us to incorporate in a certain way um, what we usually understand with algorithms. Mm -hmm. Why I'm saying that? Because uh, phenomenological critique, as you showed us very well, uh, towards uh, the uh, domination, the purposive, purposiveness of uh, algorithms uh, has, uh, has, let me say, uh, also a political taste. We are in a certain way afraid that a uh, world dominated by algorithms could uh, uh, restrain or uh, reduce our uh, room of maneuver, our freedom, and so on. Isn't that that a different uh, mathematical frame would allow us to uh, see better from a different perspective the limits of what we could define the algorithmization of the world? Mm -hmm. This is just a suggestion as you can imagine, because first of all, I have not the mathematical competences in order to articulate this question, but I'd like to know what do you think about it. Thank you. Um, yes, I think that uh, it is a quite uh, complicated, of course, question that you are uh, posing, but what I would um, reply is that uh, like the concept of manifaltigkeit, um, this comes to Husserl from, of course, Weierstrass, but also from like um, the, the, his reading and interpreting of Bernard Bolzano. So, you know, and so the point that I would say is again, like the um, attempt uh, made by Husserl to think about a theory of theories, which is related to the formal ontological domain. So again, I would say that the um, uh, Husserl is concerned there by the um, attempt, with the attempt to build or imagine or envisage like a correspondence again between the ontological level on, a, on the formal on the formal level, and uh, um, so the scientific side of the of the problem and the subjective 
uh, one. So the idea of building this parallelism between formal logic and on the, on formal ontology, then also to specify it within the different regional um, domains. And in this sense, uh, of course, uh, we could think about this uh, mathematical um, version, let's say, of the life world as a um, way to address or to access the problem of uh, um, algorithms in phenomenology. Um, the problem is that I think we need something, by the way, something external, external tools to that of Husserl, because anyway, the critique that he is doing, like in the crisis of the European sciences about the mathematization and so on also is like it speaks against this kind of a, of attempt. So we have to integrate in the phenomenological discourse other maybe languages or uh, I don't know, yeah, theories as I tried to show in, 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 uh, um, in my talk. So this could be like a way to address the problem, but I think that with do certain himself, it would, we will not be able like to properly theorize it then, like we need something more than that, I would say. I just comment on this briefly. No, of course, it, it, I totally agree with you. In Husser, we do not find all, what we would like to find in a certain way, yeah. but the very simple, and if you want very naive uh, idea as well behind my question, or possible question was that uh, uh, if uh, uh, it were possible to find any form of uh, politics mm -hmm. uh, within Husserl's phenomenology, this, this could be found within uh, his mathematical mm -hmm. uh, ideas, uh, in the sense that the broader the uh, mathematical frame within which we understand the numbers and all mathematical entities, the biggest, the largest is uh, uh, the room of maneuver of the transcendental subject, which remains for Husserl, I say it in English, mm -hmm. <laughs> the, um, the, the model of every form of possible subjectivation. Mm -hmm. is for very, mm -hmm. To put it very simply, and I, the idea. But, well, thank you very much. Uh, I ask our audience, or Julia, or Andrea. Yes, here we have a question from... Please, come here. Come here. Oh, I don't know if, if I speak no, here no, no. or maybe there's a double sound. Well, actually, <clears throat> um, I, I would like to ask you something which is uh, partially overlapping with also with what uh, uh, Julian was saying, but uh, I, I ask you basically because uh, I am somehow more sympathetic with your approach. And um, the question, the double question would be the following. Um, uh, the first one, um, especially in the previous uh, um, uh, account, uh, but you didn't contest it, mm -hmm. this is what uh, stri strike me, strikes me. Um, uh, it was spoken very often of a body of knowledge, for example, lying in the internet, of mm -hmm. uh, learning of machines. Now, from what you say mm -hmm. about uh, the, uh, if I have it correctly understood, the essential nature of uh, embodiment in, uh, with reference to all kinds of knowledge, mm -hmm. uh, and so the reference to body, context, etc. I'm wondering if you would uh, not uh, um, have any objection to the use of these notions of like knowledge or learning, mm -hmm. if we are not uh, intrinsically used in an ambiguous way that is uh, uh, mentioning uh, processes that actually are not uh, absolutely, there is no guarantee that they are the same, what we mm, call knowledge and what uh, uh, might be uh, the availability of some uh, amount of information in a technical sense uh, on uh, in the internet or wherever, where uh, can we say that we are both knowledge? I will ask you, I know that I could ask Julian, but uh, uh, I'm afraid that um, so in your case, I wonder mm -hmm. if you, you don't find an objection this way. Mm -hmm. The second question is uh, more uh, central for um, uh, your account, that is, um, if 
embodiment is uh, uh, so uh, central mm -hmm. to um, knowledge, meaning, etc. Well, the objection that uh, could be raised and that uh, sometimes is raised when I uh, move similar uh, arguments is, uh, uh, well, uh, um, why does embodiment not uh, exclude communication, intersubjective communication? That is, I have a body, you have a body, we are embodied beings. Mm -hmm. In that sense, uh, uh, is not in, the, in this an obstacle to the general or universal nature of uh, uh, meaning, of communication, of uh, uh, sharing uh, information. Uh, is not the, the fact that we are embodied already a problem in that sense. I think it is not, but uh, mm -hmm. I will ask you for <laughs> knowing you, uh, what you mean about it. Um, I would put a further uh, uh, corollary that is, uh, um, we could maybe conclude that there is some kind of uh, limitation to communication in embodiment, not an exclusion, but some kind of, of limitation. And uh, maybe a reflection on what kind of limitation is uh, bound to the fact that our meanings are embodied meanings uh, would bring us to uh, some interesting conclusions about uh, uh, what exactly can we are able to communicate and what you are unable to communicate or under which conditions can we communicate. For example, uh, sharing a Lebensform mm -hmm. would say somebody like uh, uh, Wittgenstein is essential in order to be able to communicate. And if he, he doesn't speak of uh, Lebensform, but uh, uh, I have used for making an analogy with, uh, with Husserl. Yeah. That's it. I move away. So that, uh, um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, there are different, like, um, of course, questions. So uh, I will try to uh, answer, like, globally. Um, Yes, the, like the re I remember, like and maybe you also remember this article that was published back in, I think, two thousand by Chris Wire, who was the director of Wired um, America, who spoke like about the end of theory, meaning that data processing is bringing us like to a totally different kind of knowledge. Uh, and he calls that knowledge, meaning basically that data processing, and he, mean, he meant at the time that. At some point, we would have had um, like all data that we actually need in order to, you know, know basic, basic but also complex information that just like uh, exhausts one field of research or one problem and so on. And actually, there is a lot of uh, um, research, but I would say also of uh, um, commercial enterprises that are based on this uh, idea, of course, like also all the total recall project uh, at Microsoft um, is based uh, um, on this. So on the idea that no, no knowing knowledge is basically to have um, sufficient data in order to solve problems. And this is just uh, like a way to address your questions, of course, uh, um, to say that um, this is <laughs> a totally different account of knowledge of, no, of knowledge than the one that we try to give uh, in phenomenological terms, of course. And this brings me to the other uh, questions that you uh, asked, um, precisely because there is the embodiment level in, in the end. Like, um, I do think that embodiment is central to knowledge and I do think that it is like providing us with both um, limits to our knowledge, which helps as, uh, which help us also define the difference between our knowledge, like human knowledge, and that of the machines, for instance, in the way Chris Wilde interpreted it. Um, but also, um, these also provide us with some kind of, we we'll call them invariants of uh, shared, like uh, patterns that we do share. So, of course, always in contextualized. Um, 
you know, in, in, in specific contexts. And in this sense, um, embodied knowledge is uh, like an obstacle, uh, an obstacle to the universal like sharing of, of uh, uh, information. But it also facilitates it uh, as long as we understand it as contextual. And if we rely on, uh, on a phenomenological point of view, for instance, to the notion of uh, invariance or um, to other tools that I think are useful in this case, such as the, uh, for instance, the variation. So the use of examples, for instance, is a good way in order to find both limits to the possibility of sharing knowledge in human terms, but also like common, common a common ground that we can, uh, that we both or all can uh, base on. And so this, um, see, yeah, and, and this uh, to come to the third point that you were mentioning, um, this also should give some clues about how how do we communicate. So, um, it really, uh, referring to the fact that meanings are embodied meanings. So this is precisely what I would reply. Like that, of course, if we uh, understand knowledge as an embodied knowledge in phenomenological um, terms, we do have like the limitation of the of, of the body itself. So that is always contextualized in knowledge and depend, also depending on the kind of task or problems that we are uh, referring to, we have to, of course, use different skills or different uh, references that we probably share. But like, I don't think that the idea that you were, as long as, long as I understand you correctly, the idea of the uh, universal like sharing of information is like possible or relevant from a phenomenological point of view, but I'm not sure that I understood no. correctly your your question in, in yeah, this. Yeah, sure, sure. I, I don't know if you, because it is very impractical to... Oh, yes, you should come back again. <laughs> uh, no, okay. The, the, um, uh, I, I'm, of course, satisfied uh, in the limits uh, in of, of this discussion because uh, we cannot maybe uh, discuss too, too deeply in the, uh, with, the, with reference to this, this question. Um, my point is that uh, um, Speaking about knowledge when we talk about uh, uh, information mm -hmm. is uh, really an abuse of semantics mm -hmm. and, uh, and is not just uh, uh, is, is not really excusable mm -hmm. in the sense that uh, uh, we tend to forget that uh, uh, essentially, it, it, this is an essential point, at the end of the terminal, at the end of the uh, screen mm -hmm. or whatever, there must be mm -hmm. an interpreting subject, without which all those data are just nothing, mm -hmm. are no knowledge, are no information, are no, are just uh, exactly like when we speak about the books and we think that, well, a book in the end is uh, an amount of small stains on a piece, on a white piece, and this is what a book is. The difference between what a book is in this sense and what a, the uh, brother Karamazov is as a great uh, piece of art is the fact that in the mid, in the middle, there is a subject, an historical subject that is able to make alive mm -hmm. this information. So if we, in a sense, remove this element, we tend to project, in a sense, uh, tacitly, mm -hmm. uh, an idea of knowledge, of learning, etc that in fact is something very different. Mm -hmm. And this has an implication with reference to the limit of, of uh, understanding knowledge communication. Think of, uh, uh, if we imagine that this is already knowledge, we think that it is irrelevant if uh, this knowledge, this data, let's say, is provided, given to whoever that is to an uh, uh, inhabitant of uh, Fiji, of a children, of a, or to children, to uh, uh, um, middle-aged uh, <coughs> man come here for the time machine or uh, forever. This is irrelevant because the fact this is already knowledge. But I think that this is absolutely wrong. This is not already knowledge. It is knowledge according to who is receiving it and what use he wants, he or she wants to make of it. Mm -hmm. And this is a 
extremely important because, in fact, when uh, these uh, when we talk about enterprises, private enterprises mm -hmm. that make use of this data, of course, they have an agenda with a certain targets and uh, with certain ends, according to which those data are, in a sense, are interpretable and this in, the, in the sense they are knowledge, mm -hmm. but they are not the same thing anywhere mm -hmm. for for mm -hmm. any subject. And um, uh, for some subjects could be not knowledge, but could be, for example, just a noise. I mm -hmm. uh, and I stop here, maybe we yeah, yeah, we will. But that just to say that I agree with you on this point. This is why actually I started the talk by quoting the, the Turing, 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 Turing experiment and underlining the shift to the observer point of view, like the person that has to, in the experiment, guess, let's say, if he or she is speaking to a machine or a, or a person or a human right. intelligence in the end. So I, I actually agree. Can I come in on this, please? Uh, before uh, uh, reading the questions in the chat, uh, there are two questions. The first one coming no. from Julian, the second one from Giuseppe Longo. Please, Julian, you have the word. Yeah, so uh, I don't disagree with what the last uh, question was arguing for that uh, that knowledge requires an interpreting subject but the you know, the people that are building machine learning programs are uh, attempting to explain how uh, learning how knowledge could be acquired by a machine um, so they would disagree with your claim that there can only be knowledge if there's an interpreting subject. And they would argue that you know, what these machines are able to do by extracting statistical correlations that map onto human categories is precisely an acquiring of knowledge. And therefore, knowledge is something that machines could, uh, could learn. What is learning? Learning is the acquisition of knowledge. And the project of artificial intelligence is to attempt to uh, explain that process of acquiring knowledge in mechanistic terms. Now, I know that that's uh, something that's very foreign to us coming from the phenomenological tradition. Um, and uh, you know, part of what Dreyfus was trying to do was to, to show that in the end, uh, knowledge is tied to the life world. Uh, it's tied to knowing your way around social cultural practices. And um, so if machines are to develop, acquire knowledge, then it will only be by learning how to take part in, participate in those practices. That's what my talk was arguing for. And um, so, you know, is there knowledge on the internet? Well, if you are a proponent of artificial intelligence, and then you think that uh, knowledge is something that can be acquired through being exposed to massive amount of data, and that's the that's the program, that's the scientific research project that these people are engaged in. Um, what I was attempting to do was to draw from phenom phenomenology uh, reasons for and uh, for being critical of that research program. Uh, so I hope that clarifies where I was coming from. Uh, allows you to see that there is some common ground, but there's also a challenge here that needs to be addressed. Giuseppe Longo, it's your turn, please. Um, <laughs> yes, it was mentioned about AlphaGo. You know, uh, there was a hype already with uh, the blue, uh, the machine that won against Gaspar for chess. They immediately said, and it was the main motivation, we will apply this machine to lots of problem solving, and we will really face a variety of issues. That I know nothing happened, it has not been applied. It's not so with AlphaGo. AlphaGo, uh, when they it played and won in Go, in 2015, uh, a year later, it was bought uh, by the Houston Cancer Institute in order to help doctors in uh, recognizing, um, you know, by uh, histology, in histology, recognize cancer where the primary or metastatic 
or, or uh, benign or malign. And uh, 60 million were invested in the use for diagnosis and also prognosis and help on therapy by you know, interacting machines. 60 million dollars have been invested till a few months ago when they gave up totally the project. It was a complete failure. So these two attempts of a machine that meant to be generic, as the promoters claim, generic means rather relatively universal in applications because the technique is universal. They use the same technique for voice recognition, for image recognition, the filtering, convolution and filtering, convolution and filtering, then transformation in uh, discrete state machines, in spite of being generic, are extremely special purposes. I'm wondering how much doctors you could train with $60 million. I mean, that's, that's a real shame. That's just to mention a major issue. Then um, I'm very glad that Turing was mentioned, you know, it's a major reference for me. Turing's 50 paper is about an imitation game, it's not a test. And it is an imitation, an attempted imitation of a, a, a woman, a woman's brain. And that's not a secondary matter for him. Uh, he knew that the police at any moment could ask him, are you a man, a woman? And then he wants a machine to answer to this question. Just kidding. And it's a dramatic paper. It's absolutely dramatic because that, that's his concern. A process will start in 52 and he will kill himself in 54 because of the hormone therapy. He was forced to follow. And um, so we are in the middle of a drama. That's the way of reading the paper. What must be read in the paper is that excellent, fantastic mathematical physics, because he's already beginning to write the 52 paper morphogenesis. And first he says, the brain is not a discrete state machine because a minor impulse may change the behavior of the brain below observation. A minor impulse above observation is taking care of the system that will be later called sensitive to dynamic, to sensitive to border conditions that will be at the core of his mathematical paper <clears throat> for Genesis 52. That's what really matters in the paper. He makes the remarks on the electrons and so on. So I think AI people have been reading that paper without understanding it, without understanding the mathematics. I wrote a letter to, to Alan Turing, which has been translated in English, and I wrote it in Italian, in English, and in, in, in German and in French. But uh, just uh, going back to the interpretation of these three fundamental pieces of Vim, I mean, 36 and 50 and 52, 36 is the invention of the Turing machine. So really, there has been a misunderstanding. Uh, even the name test is not in the paper, it's not in his idea, it's imitation. Why in 52 we we'll do a model of morphogenesis, which, which means it tries to focus on the, the causal structure that causes the genesis of forms in organs. And he writes a paper where he falsifies, that's his work. My paper falsifies what? The need that in genesis of life forms you need the predefined design. That's what you understand at the end of the paper. He who invented the split software hardware, which is just fantastic. It was somewhat in, uh, you know, in machines, but the mathematical formalization of the split hardware software is this 36 paper, which is just fundamental for having computer science, you know. Uh, and then in 52, he writes a paper about morphogenesis where there is only a physical dynamics of hardware. Uh, that's a real scientist who can embed himself in the right phenomena. So that's the core of, say, of a phenomenological practice, to change radically approach by approaching different phenomena with the different techniques and different invention. He has been inventing morphogenesis. That's a pioneer paper ignored for 20 years. That's what I wanted to say about Turing, who has been misread by AI people instrumentally to me. In, in interviews, in the radio, yes, he sells very much his own machines. He say we will do a lot of things, which is right. We do fantastic things with these great state machines. But that's very different from the old AI projects that don't, don't exist anymore. Classical AI didn't achieve anything. The only results are like Mar uh, uh, Minsky and Pepper results against networks. You know, Rosenblatt in the 50s proposed networks, the one we are talking about as a model. 
because the brain they see and they understand is a, an interaction of neurons. So let's model it mathematically like a, a network in two dimensions, network in two dimensions. Then Minsky proved that the result that you cannot compute more than Turing computable functions uh, with or with problems with the dis disjunctive or, which is a triviality mathematically and nonsense. Because yes, of course, if you formalize the network a la Hilbert, then you cannot prove in a formal system more than Turing functions. The point is that those networks do not compute number theoretic functions. They distill, they single out invariants. That's the core idea. That has been fully understood in the 90s by Lecan and others, in which way? First, they thought that the brain is not in two dimension, but in three dimension, which is a good observation. Then they put several layers, one after the other, and then by very beautiful mathematical techniques, wavelets, methods uh, from stochastic, stochastic um, uh, methodologies borrowed from Ito theorems and so on, they, by convolution and filtering in continua, in continua, mostly, there are some te te techniques in discrete, but mostly are in continua, they do the construction of invariants. And that's fantastic. So they show to the machine 1,000 cats, and the machine singles out the silences, the invariant silences of a cat, and can distinguish a cat from a, 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 a tree, which is a, not a minor performance for a machine. I mean, it's quite a major achievement. Of course, the more they, they went on, the less it is a model, because the brain is not 25 layers of different networks, planar networks, using convolution and filtering. So again, it is an imitation in Turing's sense, something that may seem to be like a brain. Then I love the way philosophers insist about embodiment. Right, uh, that's really what I like, Husserl, Merleau-Ponty. But let's try to be more specific. What does it mean? I will say that more this afternoon in my lecture. All these machines, even the excellent ones we have in the learning now, because they do a lot, special purpose, like AlphaGo, no way to apply to cancer recognition, but anyway. Um, special purpose, but fantastic. They do a lot of things. But they are all input out of machine. The first thing that embodying means is that the brain is not an input out machine. The brain is a superactive organ. There is a total mass, a total permanent mass. If you are deprived by sensation, put in warm water with no noise, you get crazy by the excess of activity of the brain. The brain is super active. It is constrained by the interface, by the body with the environment. It's the interactions, brain environment by a body that constrains its activity. Even in the formation, the neural Darwinist by Edelman shows it. We have an explosion of connections, and then the practice of vision makes a selection, constrains the active, the active. Uh, parts of the brain. That's the first step in embodiment. Nothing to do with an input out machine. Second point is that nothing in biology can be understood without the reference to time and to history. It's the formation of the organism that is at the origin of meaning. You see, a baby is not done by screwing up a finger and then putting an eye in a hole. No, it's not done this way. It is done by embryogenesis, which means you begin with a cell, which is an organism that differentiates into tissues and then organs. And during each step of differentiation, it is an organism, which is source of meaning. In which way? Being active, being active in this form of reproduction, cell reproduction, every time it receives it, this affects its activity like the brain, which is affected by the frictions with the world. The organism is affected by this potensive activity. And this is the origin of meaning. So a hit received by a fetus at any stage of its reproduction is meaningful for the fetus with respect to its going activity of, in this case, formation, movements, and whatever. So that's why the voice of the mother is meaningful, a hit received to 
to, to the fetus is meaningful to, to the fetus. The history of the formation of an organism, of a multicellular reason, is at the origin of the formation of cells. It is the embodiment. Any machine, even the most complex one, is done by taking elementary pieces and you put them together at a certain point, it functions. Nothing to do. The history gives the orange of meaning and the device radically an organism from a machine. That's meaning of embodiment. You have to try to specify it in a different world. That's why for me, the origin of meaning is in amoeba, a eukaryote, not in bacteria. A eukaryote, which has a memory, they have retention and protection. When it receives a hit, this hit is meaningful for the amoeba because it affects the potential activity. That's what means embodiment and life with respect to the nerve, to the machines that are inert. And that's where there is a major difference. I think these elements are necessary to use this machine at the best. I'm very fun. I mean, every time there is a gadget, I buy it. I, I love interfaces with machines. But of course, consciousness of these different crucial, including where they use at the worst. The clear hegemony of all these stories is not in their successes. But as it was mentioned, they're used in the stock market. Now, 80% of uh, gains in stock market are made on fast trading that only machines can do. And what this, this means, that, you know, fast trading means that you disregard the trend. If a commodity goes like that, or if it goes like that, it doesn't matter because they earn on these. So if it goes like this, they earn on these oscillations. If, the, if it goes like this way, they earn on the oscillations. Machines in the stock market contribute to put a thought with respect to economy, in particular, in particular with respect to ecosystemic trends. That's the real point which is happening. And the immense amount of money there is what is supporting myths that do not even allow to use soundly these machines, like myths like Anderson's stuff in 2008. It's amazing what it was quoted here with big data. We'll, forecast, we act, we understand, we have knowledge. Mathematics is enough. Combinatory theory is enough to disprove that. I wrote a paper with a colleague of mine about uh, Ramsey theory applied to that as an answer to Anderson, which has been rather successful as a little paper, very simple to us, because it's an application of a difficult theorem, but the application is easy. What does it say? That if you give me a correlation, Okay. If you give me a correlation with three parameters, essentially the length, the number of things you correlate, how you divide your space of data, three parameters, if you're more, it's the same. Then I can compute the number, a cardinality, such that any set of data of that cardinality contains your correlation. I don't know, maybe it's difficult to state it without writing, but it says, whatever correlation you give me, I give you a large enough number, I can compute it, okay, a cardinality, so that any set of data that cardinality contains your correlation. Even if this set of data is produced at random by throwing dice or, uh, you know, spin up, spin down measures in quantum mechanics, it does contain your correlation. But the set of data is random. So no way to forecast whatsoever. Uh, I mean, that's, non-obvious mathematics. I mean, the, this Van der Waarden theorem is quite complex, very beautiful mathematics. Those people ignore, totally ignore. And of course it says, the more the data you have, the more chances you have to find spurious correlations, totally meaningless, because they are just given by the cardinality, by the set of data. Please go to that paper of mine, because I mean, there's it, it, nothing else to say. I mean, the more data you have, the more you have correlations that are random in the sense they only depend on the cardinality. So uh, I have nothing else to say. Which the, those kind of attitudes prevent us to make a good use of the fantastic facility we have in work by the fact that 
we have huge amounts of data. It's just great. It's extremely useful. If we know what, what we can do with them, instead of those kind of needs that are promoted by an hegemony, which I think is a stock market hegemony of this kind of uh, philosophy of nature, because there is a philosophy of nature there. Well, I will be just super, super quick. I only heard because of technical problems with the audio from the part uh, regarding Turing. So I will just say something about this. Like, um, actually, I was, um, yeah, quoting Hales on this because I was interested in the in, in Hales' like interpretation or move uh, to start with Turing to speak about this erasure of embodiment. This was just my starting point, but actually. Hale's book is entirely based on, uh, on the woman, uh, actually woman, man issue uh, in the Turing imitation model. And she beautifully reconstructed this also with reference to Turing biography as just Professor Longo um, said. So yeah, yes, it is totally important in order to actually uh, contextualize the, uh, the topic and uh, Turing imitation. Uh, yeah, not test as you, as you mentioned, but like, model, let's say. And um, regarding the point uh, about history, uh, of course, this is also, in my opinion, mm, like pivotal in order to understand correctly embodiment and um, yeah, the, the phenomenological uh, concept of embodiment. And this is actually why I did this detour in my talk about the temporality, the, uh, the Husserl's theory of temporality, and I mentioned the retention, pro uh, impression, protention structure. And of course, I was maybe uh, too, too quick on this because of due to temporal, of course, limitations to my uh, talk. But I think that Professor Longo just like added a lot of, of course, details and important um, aspects that are to be, uh, of course, uh, taken into account while speaking about this, about this topic. And I think that maybe Julian has something more to say regarding the first part, maybe, I don't know. I'll just say that I agreed with pretty much everything you said. I'm also uh, uh, critical of uh, deep learning algorithms for adopting this input output picture. Uh, I would prefer to think in terms of cycles of perception and action and living systems as active and having spontaneous organization, endogenous processes that, that are generating meaning. Um, the idea of tracing meaning back, the origins of meaning to simple life forms. I, I totally agree with you. I've written about that myself uh, and the importance of history. I think uh, I was getting at that in a slightly different way by thinking about socialization into practices or more coming at it from an anthropological, you know, cultural perspective. But the same arguments can be made biologically by thinking about self-organization and the importance of, uh, of development uh, form within self-organizing systems. Uh, I think these are very much convergent lines of argument. So uh, I've been inspired by papers by you that I've read. I don't know the mathematical papers that you mentioned. So I, I'll, if I, my maths is good enough, I will struggle through those as well. But uh, the work that you've done on uh, on self-organization has been inspiring for me and I think uh, yeah the limitations that I was attempting to argue for of, uh, of deep learning uh, we could get the same kinds of arguments through a different route by thinking about biology and thinking about life um so uh, the, the worry that these machines are still special purpose you know, I did want to just reply to that briefly and that uh, the defenders of, of AlphaGo, the, the engineers at DeepMind would, I think, respond to you that you know, the, these machines have been deployed to learn different games, first of all. So there's a generalization that's coming from the algorithms from Go to other uh, games, first of all. And the same basic architecture of uh, these policy networks, the value networks, and the kind of search algorithms that they're using have been employed to, to learn how to solve the
protein folding problem recently. Um, so it may be that when it comes to uh, medical diagnoses, I don't know the work you're referring to, that there, there's been some limitations, but there's also been some successes. Uh, should we be applying so much funding to deep learning at the expense of uh, medical research? Well, yeah, I can only agree with you that perhaps it's not the best expenditure of money and fund scarce funding that we have. Maybe we should be putting it into other forms of medical research, but uh, on, the, on the question of, uh, is this just a special purpose algorithm or is it able to do something that's more general purpose learning? Uh, I think that there are some arguments that could be made that, that these algorithms are succeeding in generalizing. Um, so, you know, it's early days, but uh, I think it's, it's maybe a mistake to conclude that they're just special purpose. Like reinforcement learning is not a special purpose form of learning. It's, uh, you know, it's, it can be used in any domain to learn about how to uh, you know which behaviors are to be reinforced and which behaviors are to be uh, suppressed because they are of negative value. So you know, that's a general purpose learning algorithm. Uh, so I'm not sure if in the end I would agree with you that this is just special purpose learning that's going on here. The protein folding work is very beautiful one as a typical example of excellent in human machine interaction. So there are very good molecular biologists also in, in Paris using it. They invented a way to use the machine and interact with it and analyze a very mechanical process, which is protein folding. So that, that's a typical success because they interacted correctly. Yeah, don't disagree with you. I'm very glad uh, of the intervention made by Professor Longo, uh, who gives us the opportunity to understand how important it is to uh, possess the correct mathematical framework, even to understand what's happening around us at the political level, because the predominance of the stakeholder society has nothing to do with the economy, neither with the economy nor with economics. It has a lot to do with power, political power, of course. But now I see seven questions here waiting for us in the chat. Uh, I begin to read the first one. Yes, yes, and try to do that. If I'm not wrong, I can begin with the first one. The first one is from Jacopo. No, oh, yeah, yeah. this one. Morning, what do you think about the Damiano, Damasio idea of incorporating emotion in artificial intelligence as a way to feel the time as an internal participation to what person would call our durée? I feel like it is a bit reductionist to think that emotion are the only layer that give rise to this sort of complexity, but maybe it is a good start point to overcome the problem problem of external temporality. Thanks. So you suggest me to yes. read all of them? Yes, maybe. Okay. Ah, okay. 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 This, is only, this is only one. Okay. Better. Okay. Uh, but there is only this question. Mm -hmm. I think so. And this other one, maybe? The second one is in Italian. Buongiorno, vorrei gentilmente fare una domanda, se fosse possibile. Se nell'universo non esistessero né il sistema nervoso né il microprocessore, quindi la mente e l'algoritmo, ci sarebbe la fenomenologia della trascendenza? Grazie. Uh, good morning. I'd like to uh, ask uh, something cons uh, whether uh, there wouldn't be uh, in the universe uh, nine, uh, neither the nervous system nor uh, the microprocessor and um, uh, the mind and the algorithm, would uh, there be phenomenology and transcendence? Thanks. This is a question posed by Walter Fasen. And this is the last one, as I cannot yes, if I'm not the wrong. One. So the first one is directed to uh, Federica, if I really 
understand correctly. I think yes, so, yeah. or to both, but please. Well, um, to incorporate the emotion, like in the, in the way Damasio suggests. Um, yes, of course, as you, as you, as the person as Jacobo wrote in, directly in, uh, in the question, it is uh, like a way to start in meaning that actually a lot of research at the moment is devoted in the phenomenological field precise, precisely in, in this direction, like integrating emotions into the, into the discourse about um, time and uh, you mentioned that this could be reductionist to think that emotion are the only layer to give rise to this sort uh, of complexity. Mm, yes, maybe like if you only take into account this, but like to speak about emotion in phenomenological sense is, on, is also to speak about a lot of others actually aspects of the phenomenological cognition like of course, like the level of the body of the kinesthetic movements and a lot of other things like it is not like emotion per se are nothing actually from a phenomenological point of view. So I don't think that it is reduction as long as you have a complex notion of, of, uh, of, uh, of emotion. And regarding the other question, if there would, wouldn't be in the universe any uh, brain, let's say, and any microprocessor, and therefore any mind and algorithm, would there be, would there still be phenomenology and, and the transcendence? Mm, what well, I don't know, actually, all that I know is that in order to think about this possibility, you must be there, at least. So uh, I think that there will be a kind of phenomenology and transcendence where we have to no other way to think about this possibility than that of the mental experiment. So I don't know how it would be without uh, a mind projecting this idea or you posing this question. I don't have the tools to answer. At least all I can say is that you are doing so in a way, maybe the answer will be no, but I actually, I don't know, uh, I must say. I don't see other questions or do you have one, please? Come here. Can I come in as well on the question about emotion? Of course. Yeah, so um, I do think emotions are very important, but we have to obviously think about what emotions are. Uh, so for Damasio there, they're tied to homeostatic processes that keep the body in balance with its environment. Uh, so emotions are, are ways of signaling that the body has about how the organism is faring uh, with regards to you know, vital parameters. Um, and I think that's got to be part of what's required for there to be meaning in the way that Professor Longo was already sketching that meaning has its origins in, in life processes where uh, bacteria, for instance, are through chemotaxis able to uh, move towards uh, gradients that are food sources and away from anything that's toxic. Um, but yeah, is that going to be sufficient if we build in those kinds of vital parameters for, um, for what I was talking about in my discussion of what's missing from deep learning? If we had uh, a, an embodied agent that had some kind of um, needs, biological needs that it had to meet, would it thereby be um, a? Would it thereby have understanding of its environment? Would it thereby be able to generate meaning? Um, so I, I think perhaps uh, that's not quite what's missing from deep learning networks. Uh, that I was trying to sketch in thinking about understanding of the world. Um, but emotion might be critical in a different way, in that it's through emotion that we are able to evaluate what's important, what's significant, um, and that our sense of what's important or significant comes from our taking part and being socialized into 
what I was calling practices. So um, if you're a artisan, a craftsman that is engaged in building furniture, then uh, the hammer is going to have a kind of meaning for you because of your, your skill as a carpenter and to make sense of the significance that the, the hammer has. In the end, we have to refer back to uh, your way of life as a human being, the fact that you are uh, a craftsperson that's engaged in making furniture. And um, so there's a kind of significance, a kind of meaning that comes from, uh, from our own understanding of ourselves and what matters to us in life. And it was that kind of understanding that I was arguing is, is still not uh, something that machines have, even if they are able to learn from us. They don't have the kind of concerns that we have as humans uh, that come from our own self-understanding, our understanding of our own existence, the way in which our being is an issue for us as human beings. Um, so I, my my, uh, my paper was attempting to argue that, that you know, that's still something that's crucial for being minded as a human being, for having thoughts that machines aren't yet able to synthesize through um, the sophisticated statistical learning techniques that they employ. Thank you, Julian. I have uh, a question for both the two. And uh, the question concerns uh, uh, machine learning and uh, the, lear the learning of a machine of uh, languages. So, um, for example, I'm, uh, I want to bring the example of uh, Google Translator, which is a very well-known uh, program. You know, first uh, Google Translator was, uh, um, uh, was made in order to learn the grammatical and the syntactical rules of a language and then to use it for translation okay it had also some uh, basis uh, uh, vocabulary and then it used it and uh, we everybody knows that when we tried you know to translate a text with google translator okay in this uh, old system it, it was a very bad, uh, it was a very bad translation. And it was also funny, you know, to see uh, how Google Translator uh, gave this um, account of another language. But now, if you uh, use it, you see that it's, um, uh, it has improved. And uh, it has improved because uh, it doesn't, it's uh, now, it's not programmed with the top down strategy. So you um, start from the structure and then you apply them okay to reality but it learns from the common language from the common language that it is on the internet websites so um, it learns in the same way children learn a language so for instance uh, um, we know that even people who don't go to school can speak a language. Even if they don't study the grammar, they don't uh, study the correct syntaxes, but they can speak anyway. Even if it's not exactly correct, okay, they make mistakes, but they can communicate, they can speak. So maybe mm, in, the, in this way, we are, um, we are programming now Okay, the machines in a way that it learns from the others and from a digital umwelt. Um, I'd like to also say to Federica that according to me, umwelt is not only the natural cultural one, but there are also um, digital now kinds of umwelt, mm -hmm. uh, which are uh, also social, of course, environments. And uh, in this way, machines uh, are in a certain way communicating, we can say, with us and learning to communicate and helping us, of course, to translate 
learning from the others and from the um, environment, environment, sorry, just as we do when we are children. Okay, I'd like to know what you think about uh, this. Thank you. Federica, do you want to start? Yeah, like, um, yeah, I, I also like, uh, as everybody of us um, noticed the impressive improvement of uh, Google Translate in the last, uh, in the last, um, Years and also like um, a lot of other uh, tools and instruments actually um, appeared appeared uh, um, or were produced um, in order for for instance for translating tasks and so like but um, uh, it is true what you're saying that of course the uh, like uh, widening of the uh, inputs that um that uh, google translate as a program is acquiring improves of course its ability to translate uh, let's say the uh, text um, i am not really sure that uh, parallelism with uh, children uh, is um is uh, working though because in the case of google translate again you have basically like um, a program that is not embodied mm -hmm. yes. and that is uh, just, you know, collecting, of course, data from the environment. Mm -hmm. Of course, there, are, there, there, is, there is now a huge debate on this called digital for sure, no. Um, but again, I would say that uh, the way um, children learn, for instance, a language this brings us back to precisely what uh, Professor Longo, for instance, was saying, like uh, that fact that our cognitive abilities and basically like the brain does not really function as a input output machine yes. in the end. So um, otherwise, again, as Professor Longo was saying, we kind of lose, um, you know, the differences between coding and processing and knowing and this brings us back again to what mm -hmm. Andrea Zoc, for instance, was yes. asking us about like the different meaning in different fields mm -hmm. of terms like knowledge and learning. So this is what, so I will still, you know, stick to the uh, limitation or differences between these two systems in a way. Um, I'd like, I would like to add that, and I didn't do it before, so it's my fault that for me, it's not the same kind of learning, but there is an analogy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so not an identity, an identity, but that analogy between the two uh, kinds of learning. And I perfectly agree with you, uh, because I'm a phenomenologist as well, that the body, okay, is, um, is very important. And also the uh, affective interaction, interaction between the children, uh, parents, mm -hmm. uh, other relatives, uh, uh, friends, and other people, okay, affects the way to learn. So I perfectly agree with you and Professor Longo. I was only um, trying to, um, uh, to uh, outline mm -hmm. that uh, pra um, the practical okay, way to learn languages of Google Translator now is more effective than a purely theoretical one. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, the analogy stays uh, especially uh, mm -hmm. on this point. Mm -hmm. So on the point of use, on the point of the uh, practical interaction. But for uh, the remaining part, I perfectly agree with what you say. Yes, Julian? Yeah, so uh, whether embodiment and affect and so on matter to learning a language, I think is exactly what is at stake in with these kinds of technologies so, so you know i agree with you that they do matter but uh, but the people that are building these kinds of algorithms might think well uh, we found different ways of realizing achieving the same results that have to that would otherwise be done through a human body uh, through uh, our algorithms we can we can arrive at the same kind of competences 
Um, so that the idea of artificial intelligence originally was that you can have the same uh, you can have the same psychological processes that are materially instantiated, realized in different ways in silicon, in the brain. Uh, that doesn't matter. You can get the same formal level of description and that formal level of description is what's important. Uh, somebody before was talking about the, uh, the critique of the mathematical worldview that we find in Husserl's crisis. Um, so the project of AI is to say, well, you can take the life world and everything that's in the life world and, and capture mathematically and statistically some patterns, correlations, and, and that can be on its own sufficient for uh, the kind of understanding that humans have as uh, members of the life world. Uh, so when it comes to language, you know, the challenge here is, is to say, well, well, is it still the case that the human embodiment of language and the way that children learn language is necessary for acquiring language? Or could it be that really what's necessary and sufficient is what these machine learning algorithms are able to do that are powering Google Translate. And um, um, what I was trying to do in my talk was to say, well, there's a way in which Google Translate can, can do something that uh, you would have needed a human translator for previously. Uh, so it can act as a kind of prosthesis for us that can take over a function that humans would have had previously, uh, the function of translating between different languages. Now, that's something we can do now mechanically, more or less. Um, but there's still something that Google Translate can't really do very well, which is to engage in conversation with us and, and make sense of mistakes that humans make, for instance, by understanding the context that the, uh, the, 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 that fragment of speech depends on for its meaning. Uh, so we're able to uh, immediately um, understands the surrounding context that a conversation is unfolding within. And that understanding of the context is crucial for, for our, our ability to, 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 make, to overlook mistakes when they occur in what someone says, um, to maybe repair what the other person is saying. Um, uh, algorithms like Google Translate have not reached the point yet where they're able to repair our mistakes uh, by making sense of the context in which we're speaking. So it's that lack of understanding of context that Dreyfus was, was also interested in uh, as a, a limit for artificial intelligence that doesn't know how to find its way around in the human world. Um, and I, I was trying to argue in my talk that that's still a, a real problem for even for machine learning today, that it doesn't have an understanding of the context in, in which humans act. So it's it's limited. Uh, the, whatever understanding it has is, is from the perspective of us as users of these technologies, but we haven't yet made machines that are capable of generating understanding themselves or generating meaning themselves. Your mic is still on mute, so I can't hear you. Everyone else probably can, but I can't. Can you hear me? Yeah, can now, yeah. So if I'm not wrong, there are no other questions remaining. If this is the case, uh, I close the uh, morning session. Uh, see you later. This means on uh, 3 p.m. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.